Once you get to that point that it's not a literal story, then you look at it and say, if it isn't literal, what do all of these things mean? Look, you can't look at this thing about God creating stars and God creating water and God creating the earth and God creating birds and all of these things and say, that's literal, but the point about the talking snake and they didn't know they didn't have any clothes on, that's not literal. It either is one thing or it's not. So the entire context then has to be that this is an evolution of something. And as we go along, you'll find out it's an evolution of you. It's an evolution of consciousness. Okay. And that's what basically this is. It has nothing to do with the physical creation. It has to do with the creation that is the evolution of ourselves. And, and, and in that way, it becomes extremely important. The evolution of the mind. So the first, one of the first things we're going to run into as we look at the, quote, evolution of ourselves and, and the evolution of life and creation and so forth is a person by the name of Adam. This is going to be the first, first, first person. Okay. Now, in understanding this Adam, we have to go back to, to that story of the, of the masturbation as it was framed of God in Memphis, Egypt, in which the seed spilled from God and the first man who then came into being was named Atom. And, and, and here then we have Atom as the source of what we know, the center of all life, which is Adam. Now we're starting to see something that makes sense. The beginning of everything is Atom. And then conveyed in an allegorical sense in an English Bible, by the name Adam. It's the same thing. Whether it's you call it Adam, A-D-A-M, or Adam, A-T-O-M, it's the same thing. But what's being spoken of at the time is that the source of all life in the primordial way was the atom. Okay. And so that's what we have. And what you're going to see as we develop then is the development from that which is the very beginning of the atom into that which then incorporated into it the mental process which is Eve and then the complexities of it as the two start to struggle with the left and the right side. The mental starts to struggle with the physical in the inclusion of Cain and Abel and all of that kind of business. Okay. So that's where we're at. Now, one of the first things you notice if you have a little Bible, you open up to page um, 2 in the Bible, and the, one of the very first things you're going to see in Genesis 2, verse 8, is the fact that a garden is going to be part of the story. Okay. Our people are going to dwell in a garden, okay. and the garden's name is Eden. And the word Eden means delight. It is the garden of delight. Delight, love, peace. That's Eden. And this is created, and it's very interesting to know something, okay? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, the primeval dwelling place of all living things, it said that the garden is planted eastward. Okay. Eastward. And remember, whenever you look north, east is always on the right side. So here then we have something. The center of life is atom. Okay. And a creative essence of that which explodes into you and me has built within it a garden of delight, a garden of life, a garden of love, which is located at the right side. It's located eastward. All right. Now, take a look, if you would, and you'll, you'll, you'll get a concept of this. If you've turned to page 716, turn to page 716, and in page 716, you'll find the book of uh, Ezekiel, all right? And Ezekiel chapter 43, page 716. Ezekiel chapter 43. Now the garden of delight, the garden of Eden, is that which is the right hemisphere of the brain. That's what's being set up for you. There is a place within you which is filled with delight, which is filled with love, which is filled with peace. In Genesis chapter 43, okay, look at verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by way of the gate whose prospect is towards the east, to the right side. Look at verse 2. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. Why? Come on, because it's at the right side. The garden of delight. Within you there is a garden. It's a word now. Remember, we, 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 we have the premise. We're not talking about literalizing anything. We're saying there is a part of you that is an entity at the right hemisphere, the creative part, which creation has tagged or termed a garden of delight. There is beauty, there is love, there is creation, there is all that is new, and it is at the right side. It is at the right hemisphere. Okay. 
Now this is, this is, this is that which is the description of, uh, uh, of, of, of what it is that we seek to return to. We are seeking to return to that which is the garden. Now there's a very interesting thing in this so-called creation epic that you're looking at. If you look at the seven days of creation, basically what you're looking at is your own creation which is the seven chakras. From the earth, to the water, to the air, to the fire, the earth being the lower mind, the water being the second stage, which is truth, the air where the soaring things fly being that which is divine consciousness, to the fire which is the sun and the stars and all of these things which are lit, which is being that which is spiritual to the fourth stage of consciousness. And then you get to a point where it says in Genesis 2.2, 2, go on, on back onto page 2 or whatever it is, Genesis chapter 2, the interesting thing is if you look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 2, and on the seventh day God ended his work. That's the seventh chakra. That's the place of peace. That's the place where you end your work. That's the place where you struggle through the Monday of your life, and the Tuesday of your life, and the Wednesday of your life, and the Thursday of your life, and your Friday of your life, and your Saturday of your life, and finally you get to the Sunday of your life, and the Sunday of your life is the S-U-N day of your life, which is the pineal gland of the brain, which throws open the kingdoms of the East inside of you, and there is life exploding. All new, all color, all excitement. The garden of delight is yours, because you have gone through the six days and now you have reached the place of Sabbath, which is the Sunday, which is the pineal gland of the brain, which is the Sabbath. And in that place, as it says in the Bible, no burden can be brought into there. No burden can be brought into the holy city on the Sabbath. That was a literal law. You couldn't bring anything, work, any effort into Jerusalem on the seventh day. But it wasn't talking about Jerusalem there. It's talking about Jerusalem in here. No burden can, the only part of you where there is no stress, there is no fear, there is no guilt, there is no hurt, there is no anger, is in that garden at the right side. And where all of the guilt and all of the fear and all of the hurt is, is in the left side, and that's where we hang out. But there is a garden of delight. And so we see that. Now let me just show you. On the seventh day, there was this rest, which means we have created these six entities and we have risen upwards into that holy place. That's why you have seven chakras. That's why you have seven days of the week, because they knew at that time of the seven planets. Go to page 1005. And in page 1005, you get to the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, verse 1, it talks about entering the Garden of Delight in a little different way. And it talks about the seven chakras, and it, it mentions those same seven days of creation, but in a little different way. And I saw in the right hand, which is the right hemisphere of the brain, of him who sat on the throne, which is that part of you that very seldom do you touch, that higher part of consciousness, a book, the book of life, written within, within you. And on the back side, that's the spine. Sealed with seven seals. That's the place of energy of all life. The place of energy of all life soars up the spinal canal. And the fluid that flows through the spine is called by the Greek term chrism, which means Christ. And so then when you generate this electrical energy within you, that sleeping servant, which is a female energy of God, coiled three and a half times at the base of your spine, comes to life, and it causes the chrism, the Christ, to, rave from the gr to rise from the grave of your lower experience, upward through that spinal canal till it impacts with the pineal, which is Aries, the lamb, and throws open the right hemisphere of the brain, and the garden of delight then bursts forth in flower and color to you. Very poetic sounding, very Disney-esque kind of sounding, but true, true. And the point is you don't have to wait till you die, you don't have to find it in a book, you experience it through yourself as you then start the movement. But you can't sit down on Monday and think tomorrow is going to be Sunday. You got to go through Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and you got to rise up through two, three, four, five until finally you impact that gland which sits at the throne so it throws open the right side. That's the whole premise of this thing. Okay. And how do I know it's true? Because I see the sun do it constantly. Every year, forever, the sun does that. There's a very interesting thing. Of course, all of this stuff is interesting. But there's something very interesting. If you look at the first page, and you're to go into the actual ancient language of the Bible, in the original language, the name of the divine entity is E-L-O-H-I-M. Elohim. Elohim. 
And what that, look at, look at Genesis chapter 1. Let me show you what Elohim means. Look at Genesis chapter 1. You see verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay? Now, watch Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Do you know what Elohim is? Elohim is the plural, plurality, however you spell it, it's two, okay? And Elohim means male and female. And do you know what? Your system of religion couldn't deal with Elohim. And so Elohim does not appear in your Bible. We took that which was the name of the divine entity, which means the male and female. You know why? Because of that too. Male and female. There's male and female in everything. There's male and female in atom. There's male and female in electricity. There's male and female in every type of energy in the world. There is male and female. In our image, man has become as one of us. Male and female, he created him. That which is the power that rises up your spine is the female. But the church, the religionists, couldn't do with that. And so in the dark ages, they got rid of the mother God. They killed the mother Elohim. And we are left with the word God. Couldn't deal with it because it's female. I'm telling you that in the original language, the name of the divine creator is Elohim, which means male and female. And it was deliberately removed and replaced with a non-entity by the name of God. For only one reason. Because women are not in any way, shape, or form to be able to be a part of that which we call the divine creator. Okay? Male and female created him and called their name Adam, which is alien. So we, we prove by this introduction the creation of energy. Male and female, which is atom, Elohim, that which is the kundalini, which rises up the, fear, the spiritual feminine energy that rises up and touches it. We further prove our scientific thesis about this, that the energy is multiplied. Now here's an interesting thing. If you take an atom, all right, and you remove from that atom an electron, you then begin to multiply the energy. It's called splitting the atom. When you split an atom, you multiply the energy. That's the way this happens in, the, in these things. The biblical allegory describes this fact. Now, remember we said this is not literal. So how does the biblical allegory describe this fact? Look at page 2 of your Bible. If you're in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, and here's Eastern allegory. Here's the way splitting of the atom is defined in an ancient document. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh, and the Lord had taken from the man the rib, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. The Lord took a rib out of Adam, and he made uh, the population. In other words, what's being told to you in the symbolic way of Eastern allegory is that all life came from the splitting of the atom. All right? Now this makes sense, doesn't it? Because you know it. You know it. But you have sat through churches and all types of churches with people telling you about the talking snake and the people with no clothes on and they ate an apple and he pulled a rib out of this guy and he made a lady and you never questioned it. Even though in your heart you knew it wasn't true. And so now you get to the point that you can't even discuss this with anybody in, in, in conservative fundamental religion because it makes sense. And do you know one thing you are not allowed to use in religion or in the fundamentalist approach to religion? That thing that I'm asking you to use now, common sense. It doesn't work in religion.